right, so we have this interesting engine that we're going to tear down today. This is a early Mazda rotary engine. It is a 10A from a Mazda RX-3. This one has been highly modified. It is a peripheral port engine. This engine was good for about 180 horsepower on the dyno, and the uh, red line was pretty high. It was revving past 10,000 RPMs in some cases, which is probably what caused the failure of this engine. I'm not too sure what went wrong, I have not really got a lot of history on this, although the engine does not currently rotate, it will just lock up, so something's definitely not right. Here's a video of it running. So the car that the engine was in was a 1972 RX-3, it was a coupe, so it was basically a street car that's been converted into a circuit car, and it went pretty well, it was a good combination, and it could hold its own against other newer, more modern fuel-injected cars. So now that we have the oil pan removed, you can see the baffle plate underneath there, and that's just to stop the oil sloshing around and causing oil starvation. Having a look inside the oil pan, things don't look good. You can see the oil is very metallic, it is very contaminated. So taking a look at the oil pump, you can see there is actually a little bit of scoring on that outside surface. So it looks like it has actually had some contamination and debris go through, probably bits of metal. Not too good. So we've pulled the stationary gear out and the teeth on the front just look absolutely destroyed. And also, if you look down where the rotor lives, where the gear used to sit, the uh, teeth on the rotor also look equally as bad, so that pretty much sums up the uh, condition of this engine. It's definitely going to need a whole bunch of new parts to get it running again. So now that we have the rear plate removed, we can take a good look inside of this engine. You can see the surface of the side plates have been lapped, and you can actually see some hot spots, which is not such a good thing, so that could be a oil film breakdown, that could just be from the high RPM, so there's a bit of friction going on and that can actually cause issues. However, I think we caught this in ju just in time. So the rotor has been pulled out, and that looks okay. The bearing looks okay, although there is a little bit of scoring and whatnot, so I imagine there was debris in the oil again. Most of it should have been picked up by the oil filter. Taking a look at the seals, they look absolutely perfect. So these pretty much measure as brand new. Having a look at the rotor housing, you can see the chrome looks okay, although there is actually a bit of chattering, especially around leading up to the exhaust port. You can tell the exhaust port has been opened up quite a bit and the uh, the width of the port is actually quite wide and there's not a, le not a lot of support material left for the apex seal which can actually cause the apex seal to flex at high RPM but it hasn't been an issue with this engine so it's probably okay. Mm -hmm.
Here we've removed the intermediate plate. This was extremely tricky. They usually are not this hard to get off, and you'll see why in a bit. But yeah, the front rotor is destroyed. You can see that it has just basically been grinding away on the side of the plate. It is absolutely destroyed. So this is the intermediate side and it has just gone blue and also you can spot a large crack through the plate so here's the rotor removed and as you can see the seals just basically you just can't really see them the bearing looks like it's been trashed the gears obviously completely destroyed as you could see from the front stationary gear earlier so you can see why it wouldn't actually rotate uh, this would have been due to over revving i imagine so having a look at the housing you can see the uh the face of it looks okay. It is a little bit worn, you can see a little bit of chattering on the chrome finish. Having a look at where the intake and exhaust are, just in between there you can see there's a bit of a mark on the housing and that is from the rotor impacting the side of the housing and that's just misalignment from the uh, gear on the rotor and the stationary gear. Obviously the gear was heavily damaged. Having a look at the eccentric shaft, you can see there's a little bit of scoring on one of the faces, although I'm sure you could probably polish this out. So that sums up the carnage. It's quite a spectacular failure. I want to take a quick look at what makes this engine a little bit different. So we'll take a look at what's actually been modified and the benefits of doing whatever to get that little bit more power out of these things. So the most obvious change with the stock engine is the porting on this one. So this is a peripheral port. So the intake port on the housing has been uh, added. That was never there originally. So we bore into the housing and sleeve it and uh, that gives us basically a direct path into the combustion chamber. On the eccentric shaft you can see where the oil comes out towards the bearing surface. That window there has been lengthened and it has been sort of scalloped out so that there is more area for oil to press through into the bearing surface. The eccentric shaft has also been lightened which also helps with high RPM and it just stops the shaft from flexing as much. Another interesting thing I've noticed is that the bearings inside the rotors have got roll pins in them to sort of pin them in place so they don't spin. Usually they're just a friction fit on later engines, but I think that Mazda actually did this from the factory on the earlier 10As and 12As which ran the twin distributors. The stationary gear as well has been drilled and tapped and has a pin that holds the bearing in place to stop that from rotating. This is actually a FD RX-7, so a 13B turbo stationary gear that has been machined down so that the teeth match the length of the original 10A stationary gear. These gears are nitrided, so that's the benefit. The front counterweight is uh, pretty much identical to the 12A Series 1 RX-7 counterweight, so it's exactly the same size, but if you were to use this rotating assembly, you'd really want to get it balanced again. So the flywheel on this engine is a custom-made billet flywheel, now made out of steel, and it only weighs about 3.5 pounds, or maybe 1.5 kgs, or whatever it is. And uh, yeah, so it's very lightweight compared to the stock cast iron unit. It of course is mounted to the uh, automatic 10A counterweight on the rear. So taking a look at our clutch, you can see there is actually a little bit of discoloration on our pressure plate, and the clutch plate itself doesn't look too flash, it's a little bit chewed up, but I'm sure it'll be okay. These clutches are pretty tough, uh, they're pretty abrasive, pretty hard on the flywheel itself, so the surface is a little bit galled up, and you can see quite a bit of discoloration from the heat. Although these flywheels do discolor because they don't have a lot of thermal mass, so they do tend to get quite hot quite quickly. Another interesting thing that was bolted to the engine is the gearbox itself, and that was a factory Mazda Racing gearbox with close ratios. So this is basically identical to the original RX-3 clamshell style gearbox with uh, just basically a different gear set inside, different ratios. So it had a very, very tall first gear, and the gears were quite close together, so you could keep the engine in the power band. So that pretty much wraps this up. Unfortunately, the engine is toast. These engines are hard to get now, and... There's not many of them, and they're quite quite unique, quite collectible, so that's unfortunate, but oh well, things happen. Anyways, hopefully someone learnt something from this. Thanks for watching.